Coming up on Market to Market, the EPA refines its decision on RFS waivers. Balancing commodity payments for the China trade war. Making way for more commerce on the lower Mississippi River. Come out of dormancy. And market analysis with Tom Fitzenmeyer next. Is going to give us a little bounce. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, September 18 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. The pandemic has created some unintended surges for retailers. Desks and chairs for the home office or classroom have been in short supply. Furniture maker IKEA said this week they are working to fill orders. Those purchases helped retail sales climb six-tenths of a percent last month. Even with the increase, the figure was still below market expectations. Without the volatility from auto sales, the index rose seven-tenths of a percent. Fed policymakers left interest rates alone, hoping to encourage spending. The 10-state rural Main Street Index rose slightly for the seventh month in a row, but remained below growth neutral. On Friday, Secretary Sonny Perdue announced that USDA would provide an additional $14 billion in aid to farmers via the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. The infusion of cash is only part of the Trump administration's renewed focus on rural America. Josh Bittner has our report. This week, the Environmental Protection Agency announced plans to deny petitions for small refinery exemptions, which previously waived fees, bringing certain domestic oil producers into compliance with the renewable fuel standard. The move includes 54 of 68 so-called gap filing requests for compliance years 2011 to 2018. Uproar from the biofuels sector prompted Corn State lawmakers to lobby the president to follow the letter of the law on the RFS and deny the waivers though EPA hadn't followed through until now. On behalf of the nation's refining trade associations, the American fuel and petrochemical manufacturers responded to EPA's announcement in part, saying, telling ethanol interests everything they want to hear in a press release is not going to increase the amount of ethanol that gasoline can absorb or do anything to help farmers and ethanol producers. EPA knows this. Late in the week, Reuters reported on Trump administration plans to relieve oil companies impacted by denied waivers. The West Wing also approved the expanded use of E-15 fuel in tanks and pumps, which previously only allowed E-10. The president greenlit year-round sales of E-15 in 2019. Farmers had hoped RFS enforcement would provide another outlet for crops while trade with China was strained the World Trade Organization ruled there was no justification for the 2018 Trump administration tariffs on some Chinese goods coming to America, calling the $200 billion U.S. action illegal. But I'm not a big fan of the WTO, that I can tell you right now. Maybe they did us a big favor. USDA's market facilitation program was an effort to assist producers impacted directly by Chinese trade retaliation against U.S. agriculture. And this week, the Government Accountability Office issued a report on $14 billion doled out in 2019. The nonpartisan watchdog found while corn and soybean producing states led in individual recipients among the well over half a million beneficiaries nationwide, critics point out operations in Secretary Sonny Perdue's home state of Georgia reaped double the national average. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. According to Louisiana Governor John Bell Edwards, the Mississippi River and its tributaries account for over $750 billion of the nation's economy. Big Muddy also supports more than 2.4 million jobs, with more than a few of those jobs involved in shipping grain to ports in Louisiana. One in every five Pelican State jobs is port-related. Work on the docks makes up nearly 23% of the state's annual income. 
but a new project is expected to help add more to everyone's bottom line. John Torpy has more in our cover story. A hurdle for shipping along the lower Mississippi River is being removed, and it is anticipated to provide benefits for businesses all along the aquatic superhighway. So we estimate that farmers could generate an additional $461 million every year, not because supply has changed, not because demand has changed, but just simply because the supply chain, our transportation system, is more economical and more efficient. The final stretch of the Mississippi River before it meets the Gulf of Mexico is home to some of the most important ports in North America. Producers of a vast array of commodities from across the country use the Mississippi River as an entry point to ship their products worldwide. This month, the state of Louisiana and the Army Corps of Engineers teamed up to deepen the shipping channel from 45 to 50 feet, making way for bigger ships and more commerce and we are connected to every state along the Mississippi River. And the 256 miles that this dredging will work, um, I think will really um, create an additional million plus dollars per vessel in a sense of capacity because they can now go deeper, which means they can carry more, which means they can sell more for the same shipping cost of that one vessel. The Mississippi River Ship Channel Dredging Project comes with a price tag of just over $270 million. A majority of the bill will be paid with federal funds, but the state of Louisiana and a number of agricultural groups are sharing some of the costs. The Army Corps of Engineers calculates the work will pay for itself in three years. The project is expected to return $7.20 for every dollar spent constructing and maintaining the channel. Mike Steenhook, executive director of the Soy Transportation Coalition, says the deeper channel will have far-reaching benefits for the rest of the country. And our analysis highlighted that you can, you'll be able to put an additional 500,000 bushels of soybeans per vessel. You often find in, in some of these ocean vessels 2.4 million bushels of soybeans uh, per vessel. This can easily push it up to 2.9 million bushels of soybeans by just going an additional five feet. And so you're just improving the economics of the supply chain. We estimate that's going to be a 13 cent per bushel savings. The project is expected to benefit the ports of Baton Rouge, Plaquemine, New Orleans, and the Port of South Louisiana by providing deep draft access to larger vessels currently moving through the newly expanded Panama Canal. Paul Oakwin, executive director of the Port of South Louisiana, spoke to Market to Market in the spring of 2017 about the need for a deeper shipping channel. We become uncompetitive and unreliable, and that goes, that hurts our farmers. And when you become uncompetitive, unreliable, they'll go someplace else. These countries that are buying our grain will find another place to buy it that's more reliable and more competitive. For products headed to overseas markets, a shallow channel was forcing some cargo vessels to leave the port at less than full capacity. According to Oakland, the smaller loads are costing shippers millions of dollars, depending on how much cargo has to be left on the dock. For ships coming into port, some cargo can be delayed due to the depth of the water in the channel. Heavier loads have to wait until it's safe to allow ships to navigate upriver. Now, what happens when a ship's coming in fully loaded at, at 45 feet? And there's a 40 foot restriction. It's got to stay outside for, for a number of days until the restriction is lifted and it can come in. We've had a ship that stayed outside the Mississippi River for 42 days at $25,000 a day. With the dredging project underway, Oakwin is pleased his three-year-old prediction for attracting new businesses to the area has come true. We have 17 new industries that have committed to coming into the Port District, and they will spend $23.2 billion, billion dollars building these new industries, which will be utilized in the river to import and export their product. From the mouth of the Mississippi River, the project will work its way north past New Orleans and stop at the port of Baton Rouge. Along the way, 
Material pulled from the bottom of the channel will be used to help build up shorelines and restore wetlands. The Coastal Protection and Restoration Authority is advising the Army Corps of Engineers and the Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development on the best locations for additional material to be placed along the Pelican State's coastline. It passes through a very fragile environment that is coastal Louisiana that uh, many folks are aware um, has been losing land at a tremendous rate. It's really a, um, a tragedy uh, and a catastrophe of national significance. That's, nonetheless, that environment protects that transportation system through which it travels. Uh, and without our coastal wetlands, without our coastal ecosystem protecting that transportation system, uh, it would be obviously a tremendous blow to, to the state, to the nation's uh, economy. Haas estimates the project could produce enough material to restore 15,000 acres of coastal wetlands. Or when we have a situation where we're dredging a lot of sediments, which of course would be the case in a Mississippi River deepening project, we want to be able to capitalize on that and use those to help build coastal wetlands that are good for the ecosystem, good for our environment, but again, in turn, good for our economy as they help protect that transportation system. You don't want to grab a shark by the tail because that shark won't eat, that shark won't do anything, and it has to keep moving to do that. The lifeblood of our uh, agricultural economy and our manufacturing and petrochemical world is about moving that product from one stage to the next, so each of those stages can compoundly add value. So um, I, I would tell you, we're all connected. For Market to Market, I'm John Torpy. Next, the Market to Market Report. China's buying spree on soybeans lifted the corn and wheat boats. For the week, December wheat jumped 33 cents while the nearby corn contract gained a dime. Contract highs were common in the soy complex this week as more long positions developed while the trade tried to figure out how much more steam is left in the boiler. The November soybean contract rallied another 48 cents. December soybean meal added 17.50 per ton. December cotton expanded 85 cents per hundredweight. In the dairy parlor, October class three milk futures improved 34 cents. The livestock sector was mixed. October cattle added $1.82. October feeders increased 185, and the October lean hog contract declined 8 cents. In the currency markets, the U.S. dollar index fell 40 ticks. October crude oil added 369 per barrel. Comex gold gained 810 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index expanded nearly 16 points to finish at 357.60. Joining us now to give us some insight is one of our regular market analysts, Tom Fitzenmeyer. Hello, Tom. Hey, Paul. How are you today? I'm all right. You know, it was, I was thinking coming into yesterday, we were going to easily talk about soybeans as the lead story. But here goes wheat today finishing up and made a 6% gain. Is there more than a sim- sympathy gain going on in wheat? Is there something else other than what soybeans are doing to help wheat? Oh, I, <clears throat> absolutely. I think that if you look at the dry weather conditions in Ukraine, in Russia, uh, starting to dry out a little bit in Argentina, um, there, there's a lot of problems wheat, with wheat around the world, and I think that's really what caught fire in the wheat market to, on, fr- on Friday. I think yeah, obviously there's some some coattails from soybeans too, but but I, I think wheat around the world's got some problems that that attracted attention too. Now, U, U.S. wheat supplies are pretty good, um, so I I don't think you want to get too carried away here and probably need to use this as a selling opportunity. But uh, th- there are some fundamental problems that that are supportive in the wheat. Are you selling? Are you selling with caution? I mean, a small percent right now. I mean, you got to take advantage of this. I would imagine. I mean, if you look at the four-month trend line, it's it's up there pretty good. But are you saying hold just a tiny little bit? Oh, I I mean, I, I, you can't see these kind of rallies and and not do something to take advantage of them. Now, I, I'm not saying you go 100 percent or anything, but taking a bite out of this certainly would be prudent and in my estimate. And I know, I know what's coming is a lot of people sold beans too early and they're in the hole and concerned about it. And that's been a big problem in beans, maybe not quite so much in wheat and corn. All right. Yeah. You're, uh, you know where we're going to get, but let's talk corn first here, Tom. Um, it's, 
you've got this carryout, you've got this large crop, and we're headed into harvest. I mean, it's beginning in earnest in, in many areas. Where's the harvest pressure on this market? Why are we headed up? His, historically, it's real, well, uh, it's a big chunk of it's been fun buying. Um, and the other big chunk of it's been Chinese buying or is the threat of more Chinese buying. So I think that's really what's driving it. And then you get a little of the, you know, the windstorm in Iowa three weeks ago in the mix here. And, uh, and that, that's generating some buying. Now, the funds are long, I don't know, roughly 70,000 contracts. And it's really rare for them to be long corn when we have a carryout projected above $2 billion. And even even the most optimistic Chinese uh, buyer bulls, I guess you'd call them, are, are aren't aren't looking for uh, them to buy enough to pull the carry out much under two four. So I, I don't know. I'm really uneasy about the the funds being long corn, even though the corn position isn't near as big as their their, their soybean position. Um, I, I just think you're getting up into the levels here where almost all the indicators are showing overbought. Uh, like you said, we're heading into harvest. Um, harvest reports have been pretty light so far. Some have been way better than expected, and some have been disappointing, which is <laughs> about what you get every year at this time. Well, and yeah, there's always that school of thought. Is it the early report that's the lowest, or is it the highest? You just don't know. Uh, so with corn, let me la ask one last question here. Uh, you buying or you selling right now on this market? Let's talk December. At, at the top end of this rally, I, I don't have any interest in being, being a buyer now. Maybe it's going to go a little higher. Ho hopefully it will from the farmer's standpoint. But, uh, you know, you're up here in this 378 to 380, 80, 81 area. I think that's a, a big area of resistance. Um, maybe you push through that a little bit more. Um, to go a lot higher, you're going to have to have some substantial Chinese buying. And, and that uh, seems unlikely, but, yeah, I mean, you never know. I guess I'd use the same statement I said in wheat. You, you don't go a whole hog selling stuff up here. We have to take a little bite of this. And short term, the basis has been quite good. So there's maybe some incentive there to move some cash if you need to, because I would expect to see a basis deterioration that's pretty substantial going into the you know, end of September, early October. All right, we've delayed it enough. Let's talk soybeans. Uh, the easy question comes from Tim in Crookston, Minnesota. He's asking what several of you did on Twitter and Facebook. How much more gas does this soybean rally have? Yeah, that's all I've heard all week. So <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not surprised. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, every, every time it, you think it's about done, it goes up another 15 cents. So um, the, the tricky part on beans here is what do you plug in for Chinese buying? If they buy an, an extra 200 million bushels of soybeans and it pulls a carryout down to 200 or 250, then then you're probably going to 12 dollars. Um, so ch Chinese buying is really the, the key to what goes on here. And and if if you know the answer to that, we'll uh, make you the host forever. Well, let's just say uh, that's why I ask you these questions, Tom. You've done it a couple of years, but. I had somebody send me a message today, though, and they were saying, uh, be careful, this doesn't, there are some out there saying this is a long-term situation. Do you see a long tail on this? And when I say long, I mean two to three years. Do you see this lasting one to two days, one to two weeks on this run-up? What's the strategy? That, my, my question is, what's the strategy? Are they, are they buying beans to put in inventory as a hedge against a... Um, uh, La Nina problem in South America this winter, which is which is certainly shaping up to be a possibility. Are they accumulating inventory so that we could get another dust up with with our president uh, and he threatens more tariffs? They've got some inventory to to sort of ride that out. What what's their long term strategy? That's the question. Certainly, this rally in soybeans is going to incentivize the daylights out of South America to plant more soybeans. And so, if even if they have a bit, a little bit of an anemia, La Nina hiccup in their yield, some of that's going to be compensated for by by an acreage increase. So, there, there's a lot of moving parts here, and uh, the big unknown is what, what's China going to do now. The U.S. crop is probably going to be the second largest we've harvested. Now, it's not as good as we thought it was six weeks ago. Uh, but it's still going to be pretty 
darn good in, in all likelihood. There's dry areas where it's not going to be very good, but there's a big chunk of the, the country that's going to have pretty darn good bean yields. I was reading you something. Before. I know that wasn't a very good that wasn't a very good answer, I know, but uh, it, it, there's a lot of unknowns here. There are, and there's a question here, and I'm gonna. We'll probably dive more in Market Plus, but I just want to read a little bit of it. You know, farmers were punished last year for being sale hesitant during the seasonal rally, which when the crop didn't look any very good. Then this year, every analyst we know it's not every analyst was bearish. Crop looked amazing, and now you're punished for being diligent and heavily sold. You can't win. I've got a customer that likes to always say it's hard to be right. And, and I guess that, that would be a perfect example yeah. of it. it. It is hard to be right. And, and you know, those people that were bearish were, were right six weeks ago yeah. when the crop looked excellent and when the, when the Chinese hadn't started buying yet. So circumstances change and you have to adjust with them. That's, that's kind of part of the deal, unfortunately. And I know a lot of farmers don't like that, don't like to have to make those adjustments and, and I don't either, but that's, that's kind of what you have to do. We'll talk strategies in Market Plus, so I'll ask you before we leave soybeans, are you selling right now or are you holding? Well, I'm, I'm ca- I guess I'm cautiously optimistic, but it, then again, you put $2 on soybeans. How much more do you have to put on? I, the basis is somewhat decent in a lot of places. I think you have to take advantage of this a little bit, uh, especially if you are going to have storage issues. So. Um, I'm, I'm not going whole hog selling yeah. things, but uh, you, you just have to take a piece of it. And if you're scared to death of the futures, go buy yourself a put. And, and the price of those is elevated a little bit, but you know, at least you know what your risk is. All right, here's another one that's a head scratcher this week, the live cattle market. Uh, th- there's a lot of fundamentals that are screaming, how on earth can this thing rally? But yet it goes and puts another rally There's a discussion among futures and cash people right now about one being better than the other, but we still are trending higher. Are we going to keep trending higher? Uh, This is the the cattle market is getting pretty top. I I think longer term it it could, but I'm not sure there's a whole lot left in this in in, in the short run here. I I think it's starting to act a little toppy. Um, Not that I think there's going to be a huge pullback, but I think you could start to turn sideways. Now, I, I guess I disagree with you a little bit in that I think domestic demand has been pretty darn good for beef. It's continued right into the fall here, which is, is great. Export demand has been okay. Um, I, I just think the cattle market's probably all right longer term. Don't get too shook up if it has a pullback because I think all that is is just a, you know, just a normal correction of a market that's tending to move higher. Well, and the only reason I, I, I know you're probably going to ask, yeah, I, I, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I mean, there's a debate about, what that consumer is buying right now and you read different parts you know retail sales were down that's not food but there's always that concern about what does that consumer have to spend and beef's one of those that usually trends down but that's conventional wisdom and 2020 has told us conventional wisdom's out the window i need to move to feeders here for a minute uh, is there any incentive for a lot to to fill up pens right now with feeder cattle Boy, that, that's the one that's really been confounding in my mind is historically when, when grain prices rally like corn and meal have, uh, it really hurts the feeder market. And yet the feeder market's hung in there quite well. I mean, we're not that far off the highs. We're up again today with with, with everything, all the grains being higher. So I, I think you have to be somewhat impressed with Apparently, somebody thinking they, thinking they they can buy feeders at these prices and make some money on them. That strength in the fat market is probably helping incentivize that to some extent. So, <clears throat> given the way it's acted, if corn and soybean meal should happen to top out, I, I think you you could be setting yourself up for a pretty nice little pop here in the feeder market, back up into that 148 area, which I think was what we were talking about the last time I was on the show with you. So. I guess I haven't. I don't see any reason to get real carried away on the negative side, given how the how that market's reacted here in the last week or month, really. Right. Uh, feeder or the uh, the the hog market. We had a pretty good run up and then declined eight cents on the week. Uh, is this a breather, or a tr- uh, are we headed back up yeah. higher? Well, you got two different things going on. The October contract, which is a spot month, the cash market has been quite strong. Uh, the fundamentals aren't quite as positive for, for the December contract. We have more hogs going to hit the market. Uh, 
late, later in that in that fourth quarter. So I guess I'd be a little cautious about how much more is left on that December contract. You get that up another couple bucks, and I think you'd probably want to start to be a seller there. October contract, um, I don't, you know, it, it doesn't have that much time left, and and that's pretty much a cash market. So I don't okay. really know about that that much. All right, Tom, we'll talk a little more livestock. Get into that a little bit. Tom Fitzmaier, thank you so much. That will do it for this installment of the TV show we call Market to Market. And we will talk more in Market Plus. You can join us there. We'll answer your questions. You can find it on our website at markettomarket.org. As Harvest gets going, you may be away from your TV when our program airs in your area. So just hit up our YouTube channel to get full videos of our stories, program, and that segment we call Market Plus. Subscribe now at youtube.com slash markettomarket. Next week, we'll look at the impact of weather on the crop as harvest begins in earnest. Until then, thanks for watching and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.